my cell phone. Shame on you. And it's right up there. Where's Jeremy when we need him? Oh my goodness, <laughs> don't tell him. <laughs> oh, just wait till tonight. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Good morning. Good morning. Blessing of the Lord be upon you. Bless, Bless you in the name, name of the Lord. Lord. Thank you. Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 11. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul writes, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Neo-Pentecostalism has caused confusion about spirituality. Many churches have changed their worship services into three-room <laughs> services to meet a non-biblical standard of spirituality. I was watching an episode of Little House on the Prairie yesterday. Why? Not <laughs> much of anything else on to watch. <laughs> But it happened to be the one where uh, the older daughter, Mary. Mary. Mary, took the preaching position, Teach. teaching position at a town uh, so far north of where they lived. And it was controlled by a woman, Miss Peel, or Mrs. Peel. And, mm -hmm. and she was one who, she had the Holy Spirit, and she just led the town. Everybody was afraid of her because, boy, she she just brought fear and damnation on everybody. Anyway, that was her, their standard of spirituality. Well, that's not the biblical standard of spirituality. What was true in the first century is true today. And the church at Corinth is an example, and I know we read from Colossians, but we want to go to Corinth, Corinth, the church at Corinth, as an example. Okay? And listen to this. Just because someone had a gift of the Holy Spirit, whether real then or perceived now, did not make them spiritual. How do we know that? Well, they were told that they were carnal. But still, they had miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3, and 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1 through 40, right? You're carnal. How can, I, how can we be carnal? We've got the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We speak in tongues. We prophesy. We do this and we do that. Paul says you're carnal. Hmm. How do you separate? How do you figure this out. Secondly, emphasizing spiritual gifts in the worship assemblies was discouraged and restricted. And that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. They, they, they had the real gift, and they were told, hey, not everybody's supposed to be doing this. You just don't jump up and do these things. It, you know, well, if, if you're going to speak in tongues, well, let two or three do it, but make sure there's an interpreter there and, and, and a message comes out of it and that message is plain and it comes from God and, and a prophecy, yeah, you know, but, but control this, you know. 
Well, the stuff that goes on today is just crazy. If you watch some of the stuff that they do, and even on TV, you know, here's a preacher, he's preaching, and all of a sudden he runs off a bunch of gibberish, and it's like, oh, he's speaking in tongues. He's a spiritual man. <laughs> Uh, I've been places where there'd be a speaker and he'd be a foreign speaker and he's speaking and he'll go along and then you get a twinkle in his eyes and he'll speak in some type of a accent and all the women will giggle. <laughs> he was like, what's going on here? Is this a message being spoken or is this popularity. What's happening? We want to examine the Holy Spirit inspired response to a failure of Christians to understand and act in a truly spiritual manner. And, and you know that, that has to be brought forth first in, in worship. In worship. What is worship about? What is worship for? And, and what constitutes worship? All those things would apply. But, but Paul had something he wanted to say to the church at Colossae. The letter to Colossians. And you know what? They had as much problem as corn. Maybe not as bad materially, but they had some bad problems spiritually. Consider these fundamental problems. Their primary spiritual influence was not Jesus Christ, but vain philosophies. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 15. He warns them, hey, don't follow vain philosophies. They were Greeks. What, what had they been following? Vain philosophies. Stoicism. You know, all these things, uh, mainly Stoicism, that, that was a big thing back in those days. Their measurement of spirituality was not Jesus' teaching, but for the most part, the law of Moses. Hey, we found a new philosophy. It's the law of Moses. Uh, chapter 2, verses 16 through 23. They turned the law of Moses into a philosophy, a philosophy of life. Listen. Are the things in the law of Moses, especially like the book of Proverbs, that, that say, here's how you can lead a good life? Well, sure, but can you lead a good life and not be spiritual? Yeah, you can be ethical, and you can have a good life. You can be moral and have a good life, and still not be spiritual in the sense of, knowing and understanding and having a right relationship with God. Their focus of godliness was not Jesus, but worldly pleasure. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. They still practice their pre-Christian passions and behaviors. He warns them about some things, right? Uh, what did we just talk about? You know, put away those <clears throat> passions. They did not treat each other as Christians ought to treat one another. Chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. Well, they were lying to one another. They were cheating one another. Uh, all those kinds of things. Stealing from one another. Their basic relationships needed fundamental adjustments. Hey, here's how you treat your family. Here's how you treat your neighbor. They had a lot of problems, didn't they? And it related to spiritual problems. The Colossians' ignorance of Jesus Christ affected them spiritually in two ways. Number one, they were a religious, quote unquote, people living ungodly lives. And on the face of it, what? They were just superstitious. Have you known people who... At first glance, you might say, boy, that's a, that's a religious person. But once you get to know them, they're just superstitious. Well, I've told you my history. I didn't have any real 
spiritual guidance, so to speak, no church relationship when I was younger. Uh, I come to it, but but I couldn't under I couldn't understand when I got into school, uh, sports and stuff, and uh, certain of my peers, so to speak, they do stuff and they would cross themselves. And I couldn't understand, you know, what, what are they doing? What, what's going on here? Took a long time to, to kind of figure that out. It's kind of, it's kind of like a prayer, right? They, you know, I still maybe don't even have a, but, but, but they're crossing themselves and get into playing basketball. You know, they come up to shoot a foul shot. Shoot the foul shot. Get the ball. Shoot another foul shot. It's like, what's going on? Because I know the people. I know the lives that they're living. Is, is that a good luck charm? What's a good luck charm? That's just superstition, isn't it? Is that, is that something that really talks about a change of life? Or is that something that's just, that's what they were told to do? Uh, we talked earlier in Bible class about you know, the, the, the Persians, the Iranians today, and how many people there are there that are under the thumb of the, the rulers, the mullahs, and, and what have you, and, and they do stuff. They may not want to do that stuff, but they, know they better do that stuff or they're going to be chastised, right? Did they really mean it? Or did they do it out of habit? Well, that's just what you do. I've talked before about the man that, you know, would, Come to a dinner's and on Friday. Ah, oh, I can't eat meat. I don't know why we don't eat meat, but my grandmother says you don't eat meat on Fridays. No idea, no concept. But did it out of habit? Is that is that not superstition? These Colossians, they've been baptized, but they were far from God's new creation. Colossians chapter three, verses nine and ten. They've been set apart for God's use, chapter 1, verse 2. But they had not submitted to God's way, chapter 3, verse 25. Now the second thing is, in carrying over several of their pre-Christian beliefs, they created their own religion and misnamed it Christianity, chapter 3, and verse 5. Yeah, I'll take a little bit of this and I'll take a little bit of cafeteria Christianity. That's what, that's what it's called today. That's what scholars call it today. Take it from the Bible. I'll take a little bit of this and I'll take a little bit of that, but I don't want any of that because that's my favorite sin. <laughs> their idea of spirituality was a carryover from their pagan beliefs, past pagan beliefs. Chapter 3, verses 11, verse 11, the first part of that. Look at verse 11. Here, there, or in Christ, is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Yeah, some of them, they, they were Christians, but they, you know, I, I need to be circumcised. And Paul's like, no, you don't. Yeah, I do. The law of Moses says so. But you're not under the law of Moses. Ah, but it doesn't hurt. What did Paul tell the Galatians? If you allow yourself to be uh, circumcised, uh, what does he say? You've fallen from Christ. You've fallen from grace. Now that's in a religious context. They wanted to be adopted Jews. Circumcised, free people. But that's not Christianity. And that's not where true freedom comes from. To grow spiritually, they needed to know, understand, and believe Christ. That's chapter 3, verse 11, the second part of that. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. 
He is the image of the invisible God. You know what? You want to know what God looks like? Look at Jesus. Maybe God, when we're talking about God in transcendent being, maybe doesn't look like a human being, but if God were a human being, with all the qualities, would look like Jesus in love in mercy, in actions, in speech. If you want to see God in the flesh, look at Jesus. If you want to know how God would act if He were a human, look at Jesus. John chapter 14, verse 9. What did Jesus say? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus is the reality behind everything, whether in heaven or on earth. The reality behind everything. Colossians 1, 16 through 18. Listen to this. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Jesus Christ is the force that holds the creation together. Creation has, well, creation was the act of bringing order out of chaos. He, cre he created the stuff, and then he took the stuff and he made it orderly. Did you ever see an artist work? Just take somebody who's a sculptor, right? What does he do or she do? They take the clay, boom, put that lump of clay down on the, the turntable or whatever, or step it there, whatever they do. And then they start forming and molding and shaping it into the image they want. They take that clay, that chaotic lump of whatever, and then they form out of it. Something orderly. Something that's supposed to be beautiful, aesthetically pleasing. That's what Jesus did. Jesus Christ keeps all creation from doing what? Returning to complete chaos. He holds it together. But someday, someday he's going to say, you know what, it's finished. It's finished. And all of it's going to fall apart to nothing again. Jesus Christ is the head of the church, God's spiritual creation, Colossians 1.18. Christ was God's model for the physical creation. God's model for the physical creation. And Jesus is God's model for the spiritual creation. How can that be? How can that be? Christ was God's model for the physical creation. This is what I want my creation to be. I want it to be like Messiah, the Christ. What is he? <laughs> He's everything. We even sing that song, don't we? Yeah. He is my everything. Well, everything. Everything is understood in Christ. The Old Testament is understood in Christ. Everything, everything that's there, creation is understood in Christ. Everything about us is understood in Christ. That's why we're here, for Christ. And Jesus, as the human being, part of Christ, is God's model for spiritual creation. He, Jesus, is what God wants us to be. He wants us to be like Him. As, as, as Jesus is... The image of God the Father. God wants us to be the image of Jesus Christ. Therefore, Jesus Christ is the standard of our spirituality. And you know what they say. If you're going to emulate something, emulate the best. So we must use the same standard to determine if we are spiritual today. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah.
Is Jesus Christ the one in my life? That's a question I have to ask myself. Is he? Or do I have a different spiritual influence? Is Jesus' life and teaching the basic criteria I use for measuring my spirituality? Is the godliness that Jesus demonstrated the true focus of my life? Have I stopped the sinful practices that condemned me in the first place? Hmm. That's a hard one. That's a hard one. If it condemned me, then I need to quit it. Because if it condemned me then, you know what? It condemns me now. Have I learned to treat others as Jesus would treat them? Do unto others as you would have others do unto you? Well, well, that's a good start, right? But, yeah, hey, I don't care if you beat your wife. Let me beat my wife. No, that's not how it works. Jesus says no. Are my basic relationships fulfilled and fulfilling? Fulfilled and fulfilling. Am I working toward these as my goals? And that's just some things. That's just some things to work. Boy, that's plenty to work at, isn't it? Right there. And many people live or strive to live spiritual lives, but make two crucial mistakes. Number one, they try to be spiritual without Jesus Christ. Uh, being the spiritual source in their lives. Do I have an extra two in there? I don't. They tried to be spiritual without Jesus Christ being the Spirit. I got it right up there. I got it wrong in my notes. Yeah. They want to be spiritual without Jesus Christ being the, the spiritual source, the spiritual example even of their lives. It's impossible. It's impossible. Secondly, they try to define spirituality outside of the terms and conditions given in the inspired Word of God. Yeah, I'm a spiritual person, but I don't, I don't agree with what the Bible teaches. Where are you getting your spirituality? If you're not getting it from God's Word, you're getting it from the world, and the world isn't spiritual. The world is, let me think, worldly. <laughs> you're just doing what you want to do. Colossians 3, 16 and 17. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And that doesn't mean, oh, I'm going to drive on the sidewalk in the name of Jesus. No, that's not what that means. In the name of Jesus means by the authority of Jesus, I'm going to live an orderly life. I'm going to live a life that's ordered by Jesus, the Son of God, giving Him the glory, giving Him the praise. That's what a spiritual life is, giving Him control. True spirituality is believing with all your heart that Jesus is the Son of God and being obedient to the instructions and in righteousness He has given. So the question we have to ask ourselves, right? Am I spiritual? Am I truly a child of God? But that, you know, that's something that each and every one of us has to answer for ourselves and then go back to those things that we look at. What does my life, you know, the, the judgments being made have to be judgments that come from God. Well, there it is. That's our lesson for today. Imagine what the, how the Corinthians and the Colossians had so much in common. Hard to believe, isn't it? Well, maybe they have a lot in common with so many churches today.
Anyway, I thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your attention. If you have a need, let your request be made known as we stand and sing the invitation song.